Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, exciting finale of the Battle of the Legends between Gary Kasparov and Nigel Short, Grandmasters. Um, uh, yesterday was a very exciting day. We enjoyed the Rapid and the Four Blitz games so much that we're going to do the exact same thing today. Nigel will start out with the white pieces in the Rapid game, then we'll alternate colors for Four Blitz games after that. As far as schedule goes, this game will begin here in just a couple of moments, and then the Blitz games will begin at 3.15, and they typically start about every 15 minutes or so. I want to thank the players especially for, for joining us and putting on some exciting chess and, and creating uh, beautiful masterpieces that all of their fans will study around the world. And I want to wish them both the very best of luck. Without further ado, let's begin. And the game has begun. Nigel Short now taking off the kid gloves and deciding to play E4 by choice. And, and I think we're going to see an open Sicilian and knight or this that's after knight to F6, knight, knight to C3, C3 and will A6? A6 appear on the board? Kasparov it's hesitating. His I mean, it's his favorite defense. He must use it. Absolutely. And he has done it. And he has done it. Expect a wild game. Oh, uh, G3. But kind actually, of. maybe he's being influenced by a very recent game. Michael Adams used this to crush Anish Giri in Shamkir International only a couple of days ago and it was an amazing aggressive game where White pushed all of his pawns on the king side, annihilated black. So maybe here Short's using a little bit of technique from his countrymen. Well, maybe he should have tried this yesterday, maybe too little too late or will it be right on time? Kasparov already stopping to think, going back into his database of thousands of novelties, variations that he's played over the years. He's been prepared for everything. This guy was one of the most feared opening theoreticians, maybe of all time. I mean, he could always drop a novelty on you in just about any opening. He was absolutely prolific. And now he's got to think, what does this guy have prepared for me? He has to remember, what was it that I prepared in this variation and which style does he want to play? There's so many ways to deal with the move G3. Giri tried to play it a little bit of Cheveningen style with the move E6. And after E6, we get a very classical Nidorf. But the problem is that sometimes this bishop goes to g2, and then white simply pushes f4, g4, g5 quicker than he does in the normal variations. Mm -hmm. Actually, in the adams Geary game, Adams was simply a tempo up compared to the normal lines. Another way is to play a dragon style, play g6, put the bishop on g7, say, hey, the move a6, perhaps not the most useful in the dragon structures, but you've committed yourself to not playing a Yugoslav attack by putting the bishop on g2 instead. And he's gone a totally different route and played the move e5, the more classical Nidorf structure. This move e5, knight to b3, was the follow-up. And Kasparov, again, pausing. You saw Nigel make that move really fast. Of course, his knight was under attack, and it's the best square in this position. And Gary, once again, stopping to look at the board. So I think that slight psychological edge right away to, to Nigel. Right, and it's definitely an opening that looks for the advantage. It's not kind of this whatever, I'm going to just waste my white advantage. No, he's going for it. He has some strategical good things about his position that he can use in the future. The move g3, a little committal, you're going to have to put your bishop on g2, which is not exactly where you want to put it in many of these Niter variations, but on the other hand, it has a lot of control over the key square d5, one of the battlegrounds of this opening, and we're going to see if Kasparov's going to be able to fix his problems on d5. Well, he's just played knight bd7, short, then played a4, restricting the opponent restricting black from playing b5 so gary instead played b6 in response now bishop g2 and bishop to b7 so the bishops on the long diagonal there both controlling d5 directly and indirectly it looks as though a positional start so far kasparov going into more solid waters instead of those wild poison pawn variations that uh, he's known uh, he got he could write the book just sitting there and write out a whole book on this on these lines. And out of memory. Completely and just out, out of, of memory. memory. And just out Indeed. of memory. Just have a, a lecture for hours on those kinds of positions. But now he's in a more solid position. Something you might have expected someone like Karpov to play against him back in their world championship battles. A solid position for White. We'll see whether or not Nigel can drum up any kind of initiative from the get-go, how should white proceed here if he's going to get any kind of real play against black's position? There are many ways to try to play in this position. You can go for a very quick knight d5 and then force black to take on d5, creating a majority for white in the queen side and for black in the center slash king side. And the question then becomes whose majority is more important, whose attacks is faster. That's one way of doing things. The other one is to just play it slow, play something along the lines of queen d3, 
taking advantage of the fact that the move knight c5 can always be met with knight takes c5, and just developing, castling, rook d1, maybe bishop b3. And then a crazier line is to simply go for lines involving g4, g5, saying, hey, I really do want that d5 square for myself. Now, these are not the most common ideas, especially since you've already started with the move g3, but I've seen them happen once in a while, more often in blitz than in rapid, but it is an idea. I don't expect short to go for that. I expect for him to either play something like queen d3 or castle immediately. Uh, because of the structure specifically in this position, the idea f4 is not as good as it normally is because you won't have a target, for example, with the bishop on e6 to play an f5 with tempo, but it's still up in the air. It could still be played. It does put some pressure on the center. So we're going to see exactly what short tries to do with this position. Very flexible structure. He's been thinking quite a bit right on this move, which shows you that there are those multiple options here, and he has to decide in himself which one he should go for. Should he go for the crazy line like g4, intimidate Gary Kasparov? Those words don't seem to go together very well, because Gary's not intimidated by much, and he loves to refute rambunctious variations to prove that they're strategically incorrect. This guy is a bear. He still has that demeanor of a fighter. Uh, he just, just his presence at the board used to intimidate players, and he still has that, that charismatic fighting style, fighting pose, uh, intensity when he's sitting there. Just look at him like, make the wrong move, please. Just make the wrong move. And you might be wondering, what's going through Kasparov's head right now? And he's comparing positions. He's thinking, what is the difference with the bishop on b7? What's the difference with the bishop on e6? With the bishop already being on g2, can I save a tempo here? Can I save a tempo there? He is so exact and so familiar with all of these structures that he knows where the pieces belong. He knows when the pawn breaks need to be done, when and where the pieces need to be traded. So he's simply making sure that with this exact position, those elements are still in alignment. And he's a very emotional player, emotional person, period. He runs uh, some kind of, on some kind of different clock than the average person. His, his, his uh, longtime friend, Mike Kudakovsky, told me that sometimes Gary will call him at 3 in the morning. I mean, Gary's, Gary's just got an idea, and you got to wake up and, <laughs> hey, I got something to tell you right now, right now. That's the kind of person he is. He does everything quickly. He does everything like, uh, like somebody's chasing him. He is now sitting there. Castles has been played, and, and he also must know the best ideas in this position or some of the key ideas and was looking at them for a white, but now Castles, a very solid move. Very Cer standard. Certainly not a challenging move right at this moment like G4, but a standard move, as you said, in the position. Right. A very common idea here for Black is to play Rook C8. Of course, he could develop the bishop right away, which seems like the most natural move. And he has and done, he done so. It. Bishop to E7 has been played. And some of the momentum we talked about in the opening, short, causing Kasparov to pause just for a moment, that has kind of gone away here. As you see that Nigel is a little bit behind on the clock, but now just still playing very solid moves after the bishop e7 now playing rook to e1. Right, you might wonder what the point of rook e1 is. And actually overprotecting on e4 is rather important because I had mentioned the move rook c8. And the idea of rook c8 is that sometimes the sacrifice on c3 can become quite unpleasant. If I can get a pawn, especially a central pawn, on top of destroying your pawn structure on the queen side, this can become really, really ugly. And, well, with rook e1, this at least won't happen. The pawn on e4 is reinforced. This is not going to be an issue. A secondary idea, which is not so common for this variation specifically, but it is for others, is that when I put my rook on e1, I'm able to bring my knight from d2 to f1 to e3, which is a very good square as it targets both the f5 and d5 weaknesses. Yes, a knight on b3 is often a problem child in this opening. You sometimes play f4 in order to get it back to d4, but as you said, may not be the right moment to play it now. But still, f4 has got to be the critical kind of move to look at. Although now the rook is left from the f1 square, he might think about playing a bit more positionally. But white still has to come up with a concrete strategy. Rook to c8 has been played instead of castles, rook to c8. And Nigel playing knight d2, as you mentioned, looking like he's headed for that f1 square and then to the e3 square. Yeah, it's a very natural idea. Of course, there's a couple of problems to put in the knight on d2 immediately. The first is I'm giving up c5. So the knight can come to c5 in some cases and maybe even reroute himself to e6. d4 is particularly weak when this knight goes to e3, as I'm not going to have a bishop to go to e3 and nobody's going to be covering the d4 square. Kind of a trade of weaknesses in this position. 
Another idea uh, for black after knight d2 is to simply wait. Once you get the knight to e3, I can think about sacrificing the exchange, as I had mentioned previously, since the knight will be blocking the influence of the rook from e1 to the pawn on e4. So we're going to have to see exactly how it goes. On the other hand, because of this particular brand of knight orf, it's a little slower than usual, and I can put my knight on f1 and then simply reinforce my position. And it's interesting for black as well, because black can make a couple of moves, castles and play rook to e8, maybe bishop f8, try to waste some time. But you sh he's going to have to realize that white is making maneuvers to improve his position. And exactly. black will have to find specific ways to do the same, because you can't just sit back and watch white make moves. No, that's very dangerous. And especially if white's able to control d5 and get a knight there and eventually take with a piece, that's just the dream situation. Well, look at this. Instead of sitting still, playing solid moves, Kasparov is lashed out with h5. Wow, take a look at that move. Uh, we saw Gary do h5 and h4 yesterday, but just leaving his king in the middle of the board and signaling again with the black pieces, I want to attack. I saw you have a reaction immediately to that move. It's not exactly the most positional solid move in the world. And it's like, why are you attacking the guy? He's completely defended on that side. The knight's going to show up on that side as well. It doesn't seem positionally justified, but we are talking about Gary Kasparov, and he's saying, I don't need a draw. I'm trying to smash you today. An amazing turn of events with this move, h5, and he just played it with his trademark confidence and aggression. It's possible that h5 is a combination of ideas. I had mentioned the fact that you can maybe wait for the knight to come to e3 to sacrifice the rear rook on c3, since it would lose the control over e4. And it seems like h5 is doing that. It kind of waits for you to get the knight to e3, but at the same time, it does something very useful. You're going to be able to play h4, blast open the h file. And, and he's done so after knight to f1. Now h4 totally indicating his intentions, along with the ideas you mentioned, the potential sacrifice. And we've seen Gary push h pawns before. Remember a classic game he played against Shirov in a knight orf, where his pawns ended up on g5 and g4, and then on h3. <laughs> and, uh, and he just ripped open the diagonal towards the king. So he is known for this kind of wild play, but his h-pawn now sitting on h4. And Short might have come into the game thinking, I have the white pieces. I'm going to play even more aggressively. Okay, g3 is not the most aggressive system, but I'm going to play for some initiative. And all of a sudden, black is playing like this after 13 moves. There's a black pawn sitting on h4, sniffing around the king. And I just, just let it happen. I mean, he did have the option of playing h3 first, so as to meet h4 with g4. But the way he played it, he said, okay, I'm not really going to care. And he did play knight e3. And he's saying, I don't care about your exchange sacrifices. They're not strong enough. Now, that's a brave thing to say that's to somebody crazy. like, like Kasparov. That's I mean, crazy. Look at this. I, I'm thinking you take on g3. I'm guessing taking on g3 first. And then you take on c3. So I'm analyzing the variation. Takes on g3. Pawn takes g3. Rook takes. Pawn takes. And then... I'm not sure what to take with, but my instinct says takes with the bishop. And I don't know, the position is crazy. But the reality is that there are not a lot of pieces hovering around white's king. In this case, white maybe just trade on, on e4 and then plunk the knight down on f5. Let's right. take a look at that variation because it is highly a critical line on the analysis board. Knight to f5, and he's instead just played the move g6, g6 not sacrifice. He said that knight was thinking about going to that f5 square, but so in that line, that's a critical line for us to look at with the rook sacrificing on, on c3 and then and that whole variation just played out. The knight landing on f5 might have been the might reason been why the reason that he, he didn't decided to do not this. to go for this sacrifice. So g6, simply preventing the knight from coming to f5, a very positional quiet move after launching that pawn all the way to h4. But and now he's ready to sack on c3. Now you give he's him a ready chance. to sack to c on c3, and more importantly, it, it asks white, well, you got your knight to e3, and now what? Are you really going to plunk it down on d5? And if you're not, why did you do all this? So, so let's take a look at that line. Put a knight on d5 and see what happens. Uh, knight d5, and let's see. Right now, unfortunately for short, he would like to take everything on d5 with pieces. He doesn't want to commit his pawn structure and, play, and take with a pawn. But unfortunately for him, the uh, pawn on c2 would be hanging at the end. And it seems like even if, even if he can somehow get it back, this pawn on c2 was pretty important. The rook looks really active. 
there are no white pieces supporting any kind of aggressive stance in this position. If somehow he could steal the C file in some way. Right, uh, but he's a little below just, on development. He's a... If that bishop were already on E3 and he could play maybe rook, rook C1, C1 and B4, some ideas like that, that would be useful. But at the moment, it doesn't seem like that line works. And what's also intriguing about this advance by Kasparov is he can still castle kingside, right? He can trade on H... Trade on G3 and castle at some point in the game. It's not like it's impossible it's for not, him to do if at, at a moment where you where things get crazy. It's not that committal. There's some variations in which you just launch that H pawn and that's it. You're never going to castle. Your king's in the center forever. But in this one particularly, because the way the white pieces are posted, it doesn't seem like you can take advantage of me, for example, taking on G3, castling short, saying I'm going to go back and play positionally. And even sometimes you take on G3 and simply go king F8, king g7. The king's perfectly fine on g7. You retain that strong rook on the h file and you make your opponent uncomfortable. Suddenly the idea of doubling up on the h file doesn't seem impossible. You look at this position and it looks as though white has nothing. I mean, nothing impressive anyway. There's what nothing impressive for sure. Uh, it's definitely a little dangerous, I would say, even for white. I don't really like that he allowed black so many useful moves if you cannot get your knight to d5 because the whole point with this maneuver is to get that knight there. If you're not going to do it in this move, when are you going to do it? What other preparatory move do you have? Doesn't seem like there's any. I mean, what, what to do next? The knight is in the way of the bishop on c1. The bishop on g2 is doing what it's supposed to do. How do you get your rook into the game? The only move, the only plan seems to be knight d5, but it doesn't seem that effective. Let's take a look at it again, though. This move knight to d5, what if happens if he trades and takes back with, with uh, a pawn at the end? There's a lot of nuances in this position, of course. You want to ask yourself which knight, and when you decide which knight, what is my opponent going to recapture with? You can always go knight c d5 or knight e d5. It seems like knight c d5 makes a little bit more sense. And then I can capture now with the bishop, or I could capture with the knight. If I capture with the bishop, I can take with the pawn, maybe try to exploit some weakness on c6, maybe get the pair of bishops, or I could take with the knight. And now taking with the pawn doesn't seem as effective because f5 becomes a lot easier to play, and c6 is not nearly as weak. But I can now take with the knight. And then after bishop takes, well, what do I take with? Taking with the pawn looks okay, and then, yeah, c6 is weak, but you're never going to really be able to exploit it. On the other hand, if you take with the queen, we had already seen this variation. You play rook takes c2. It seems like an... It seems like a pawn for now. I don't see any exact way of uh, recovering it because, for example, after queen d3, with the double attack on a6 and queen on c2, you have to double defense uh, queen c8, defending both the pawn and the rook. It's possible that white has a little bit of compensation here. He does have the pair of bishops. Maybe he has some threat somewhere. But I don't think it really can be sufficient. The lines don't seem open enough for white here, especially to give away a pawn. In that kind of position, it seems white would want to win a pawn. And he's played the ultra-sophisticated rook to e2, and Gary's eyes seem to open wide on that one. Did you see that expression on his face when this move appeared on the board? Like, what's uh, this about? <laughs> rook to e2. Uh, I'm quite confused. I mean, there's a couple of problems with the move. The idea is quite obvious, actually. It defends the pawn on c2 in the variation that we just saw. So the pawn on c2 will be defended. I'm going to be able to take on d5 with the queen. However, if I do end up playing for these ideas of taking on c3, and let me just throw in the move pawn takes g3 on the analysis board. I'm going to force you to take with the pawn on uh, h file, because if you take with the pawn on f, this is just ugly, like completely ugly pawn structure. So I'm going to have to take this. And if I sacrifice now, and I take with the knight, uh, normally in the other variation, you could play knight d5. And he has begun, by the way, by trading on g3. g3. And that sacrifice you're talking about is sitting in the position Kasparov could right. whip it out right now. And the point is that if uh, you don't have knight d5, because of this unfortunate position of the rook on e2, after knight takes c3, this is a double attack that simply wins two pawns. I want my pawn on e4, the pawn on c3, and I'm going to regain my exchange. Therefore, you now have to do something. You cannot possibly play like this. This looks suicidal to me. Here, black has every good thing in the position. He's down the exchange, but look at that coordination. Between, what exchange? Yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> the rook on a1 uh, would argue that it's not in the game for now and forever, and this threat is too much. Bishop f3 would be a threat. So after knight takes e4, 
I'm threatening, you know, this idea of on c3, and now you have to play something awkward, maybe like bishop b2. Um, I don't think I'm missing anything immediate, right? You have to play something like bishop b2, but okay, this bishop is quite bad. I can follow up with either f5 or, um, oops, bishop b2. I can follow up with f5 or maybe knight f6. Bishop b2 looks ridiculous. I mean, that it's bishop just really is just ugly. terrible in that square, although he might want to play for this line, if he could get in c4 and knight d5, maybe it's only temporary. See, but the problem with doing anything like this is that, let me put my knight on f6. I just solidify my pieces in the center. I don't allow you to play knight d5, which is quite important. And then and after c4, c4, I can even go something like queen c8. I hit your pawn on c4. Your pawn structure is really ugly. Uh, I'm always going to have ideas of queen h3. Come, the queen coming down to h3, if well, knight, for some reason this bishop disappears. You've got to play knight d5 now and, and pray for rain. I mean, this, otherwise, what else are you going to do? No, I, I agree completely with you, but this is not a powerful exchange. No, this does, this does not look great yet, unless that rook can jump into a3 and somehow, somehow find some files to work with. Uh, this position definitely is a challenging one, and there's no question about it. Right now, Kasparov is studying exactly the ramifications of the sacrifice on C3. He's wondering, do I have to do it right now, or is there something else I can do? And look at Nigel uh, <laughs> take a sip of soda there, like, oh, what? nothing's going on. Make pretend. <laughs> right. He knows for sure that this electrifying sacrifice is possible, actually a standard sacrifice in this yeah, but if I Formation. know Kasparov, he's not, he's not thinking, do I have to play this? He says, can I play this? Please let me play this. He's salivating at the idea of just playing the most typical Sicilian sacrifice there has ever been, capturing on c3, destroy, destroying the pawn structure in the center. He knows it's not as easy as it sounds, that short must have some kind of resource somewhere, because it's short. I mean, he's seen the sacrifice once or twice, probably played it hundreds of times himself. So what he's wondering is, what exactly is my opponent planning to do if I do sacrifice my exchange? But there's so many pluses in Black's position. It's ultra solid. It's only an exchange. It's not even a full exchange, because you get a pawn immediately. The guy immediately. will never get the pawn back. And the pawn structure already shattered. This is a standard position where you take on c3. He's only calculating lines right now, and he's got a nice little advantage on the clock, so he can look at it and make sure, and also look to see what else could he do? I mean, if you look at this position, c3 is almost screaming to be played. Everything else is quiet. And knight d5 is coming. Like, knight d5 is actually white's plan and will appear on the board. And you will never be able to sacrifice on c3. So It's a now or never. So it's now or never. Yeah. This is maybe the most critical moment in the entire game. And yeah. he has indeed yeah, sacrificed on c3. Going for it is Kasparov and taking on e4, going for the main line. He knew he had to just make sure he was not blundering. And Short did play bishop to b2, recognizing that that is the position that he had to acquiesce to. But the sacrifice by Kasparov, bravely going forth, well, we know that it was the right thing to do from a positional standpoint. But will it now be enough? Will he be able to prove that he has sufficient play here for his sacrifice to work. Now let's take a look at some lines. Could he? Could Black maybe go with Queen A8 as an idea, maybe, and Queen get some? Queen A8 is definitely an idea. I mean, this pressure on the diagonal is unbelievably unpleasant. You're going to have ideas of Knight G5 coming up. The trade of bishops will always be nearly lethal for White because the opening of the grand diagonal will simply lead to too much coordination between Black's heavy pieces. At the moment, this would be a very serious threat. I immediately have to think, how do I patch things up in this position? Yeah, what do you do? Like, I think you have to go C4. C4 might just be timing right. necessary to put the... Luckily for short, this knight on E3 is still defending the bishop on G2, so I don't have any ideas involving, for example, knight C3, because after bishop takes C3, bishop takes, you still have that knight defending on G2. So I still cannot quite play this. Can the knight come into f6 and start the other knight, the one on d7? Right, absolutely. I mean, this looks like a very logical way of continuing. You take control over that d5 square. I mean, we can even do it the other way around. If we play knight df6, in which we were looking at earlier, we really don't see any other move but c4. And then again, this move queen a8 looks pretty logical, taking control over the d5 square. The only line to look at here, though, is knight to d5 for white and I desperation. I was looking at that, but I don't think it works. I mean, if if I simply take, take... Can, does he have to take right now? Can I he, don't see anything else. The problem he, with bishop e4 is that I have this intermediate move, knight c3. Mm -hmm. Now, after bishop takes b7, knight e2 is check, and an unfortunate positioning for the rook 
on e2, queen takes e2, and then after queen takes b7, white resigns. I mean, you're down a pawn, you're down... Well, actually, you could have probably just taken on b7 in the line instead of taking with check. That's that, also possible. That's probably stronger. Even it's, stronger, because, because there's check made on... on h1 on. and the d1 queen. Yeah, that looks... Deadly. Oh, man, so he can't play... Because if he takes on c3, then takes on e4 again. That's suicide. That's, that's suicide. suicide. That I mean, bishop is way too strong. Way too strong, especially according to... And he has strength. brought the knight to f6, bringing right. another piece into play. And what can Short possibly do about this? c4 looks like the only way to slow down the map massive black army that's a prayer and he has also followed so we're guessing right here with these moves queen and a8, queen a8 is, is the at. money move that's what we're looking at and his hand is hovering over the queen just hesitating before he go? plays this move he knows that he wants to add the pressure to the position his queen will be on this magnificent diagonal and all his pieces will be connected like a string uh, it's just tremendous this sacrifice but he's hesitating now. He's just checking. There's no question he sees the move queen to eight. He's just trying to make sure that knight d5, the critical line, does not work. Because otherwise, Troll looks like he's busted. It looks I mean, a little too easy. I think that's why he's hesitating. And he played, played queen, queen c8. c8 instead. That was my original idea that I suggested. But the more I looked at it, the more I liked queen a8 because it prevented this idea completely. Now, maybe he's seen another refutation to knight d5. Maybe he thinks at this point uh, Short cannot play knight d5. Let's take a look. And let me see what he has in store at the moment. He could, for example, take on c4 immediately. That seems like a very possible idea. No, taking on c4, and if you play knight takes on f6, then there's always bishop takes f6. Right, I don't see an issue here. But the pieces... It's not as nice as the other line. Definitely not. I'm a little more worried about things happening, but I cannot see anything for white. What about, I was going to say queen d3, is that... Maybe annoying here? Ah, queen d3 with the idea of attacking on e4, and you're also attacking my queen. And if, if you force me to trade queens, maybe this is not so ideal. I mean, probably with black's still okay, but... Knight d5 has been played. They're going down the critical variation. And he's just challenging Kasparov to prove why he played queen c8. Definitely queen a8 looked... Queen a8 looked great. I mean, we're, we're <laughs> criticizing one of the best ever right now. And, you know, it's much easier to do commentary from the side than it is to actually play the moves on the board. But this line is critical. Let's take a look at this line. Queen takes c4, looks automatic. Knight takes, bishop takes. And this move, yeah, you, have to you, take can, with you can't take with the knight because of the pin the on the pin long on. diagonal. So queen to d3. And doesn't it, it seems as though he has to trade here, yes? Queen takes... What other move do you have? There doesn't seem to be any I don't miraculous see any tactics. Tricks. I don't see any tricks here. So, for example, if you show the line d5 doesn't work because you just lose a piece to queen takes on c4. Or bishop e4 immediately also wins a piece. Right, so let's show, let's show one of those lines. Bishop takes and whatever you do here. Right, you, you cannot to, take you because take queen takes on c4. Hanging. And uh, if you play queen, queen takes, takes queen then it just... Bishop takes. Bishop takes, and that's that's, that's nothing. Winning, completely winning. So that means after queen d3, it looks like he has to play queen takes queen. Yeah, and he, he has instead not gone for taking on c4 at all. He did not want to go to this line. He took on d5. Um, now, actually, bishop takes e4 doesn't seem too appealing because now I can take on c4 with the queen. But still, not as bad as the other variations we were looking at with queen a8. He's instead played c takes on d4, yeah, on d5, excuse me. I mean, this doesn't look so bad. This doesn't feel like the other line, the queen a8 line, unless it there was desperate. something we missed. Queen a8 looked crushing. This variation, not white so seems to have calmed things down dramatically, although now Kasparov has played the move knight to g5. Knight to g5 has been played. I am not sure what the main threats are here. In fact, f4 looks like something white will think about in the future. f4 now, you have to deal with knight h3 check. But, but this is a very different position. The, the dominant yeah, advantage I, he I had, feel something went wrong. I feel rook takes c3 had to be the move. And again, we're not looking at this with engines, but queen a8 to me looked well, let's logical, not, strong. It did, it did. So let's not belabor the point too much. Maybe there, there was some kind of refutation that we're not seeing at the moment. The reality is on the board right now, it looks as though, well, the situation is this. Kasparov has sacrificed an exchange for, exchange for a bishop and pawn. No, for now, in this case, a knight and pawn. So it's a knight. He has a knight and a pawn 
for the exchange. He is not yet castled. He is sort of hovering around the king's side, but it's not the same kind of attack he had before. The bishop on b7 is not really an electrifying figure like it was before. Now that that pawn has taken up the d5 square, the that, issue, that pawn was so bad on c3. It was absolutely horrible. It's and incredible now, what has happened, actually. Now that pawn on d5 is, is holding white together. Without this pawn on d5, yes, there's a lot of attack. But now this pawn on d5 protects the bishop on g2 from being traded. It's, uh, of course, still a little dangerous for white, I feel. I feel it's still easier to play for black, but nowhere to the level that I would have expected. There and, is some danger as well. May, may I add, mm -hmm. maybe a queen could go to f5 and, right, right. and no, start some funky <laughs> ideas there's there? There's definitely ideas of queen f5, knight f3 check. There's still some problems with all of the light squares. Uh, the bishop can reroute to c8 and maybe try to trade itself on h3. And of course, there's always the question, what is white going to do? The problem with ever playing the move f4 at any point is that you have to deal with the fact that your king will become unsafe as well. Queen c5 check will force you to play something along the lines of king f1. And even though, well, in this specific variation, the knight on g5 is hanging, if you're allowing me to play a5, bishop a6, that might in the future become a very difficult thing to deal with. So, yeah, f4, I mean, it's something you want to play at some point, but it's also going to come with its risks. Absolutely, but maybe he has to take a chance now because what else can he do? to deal with the threat. The, well, let's just take a look at if queen f5 is that strong. So I'm going to make a move, and let's see if we can refute it. What about rook to a3, for example, trying to bring this piece into the game? It's, it's completely out of the way, and now it's protecting the third rank. What about this move? Is this a strong idea? I mean, rook c3 could eventually you know, get to c7, potentially. It's definitely or not an idea. It's the kind of move the short at least wants to play to be able to say, I'm a a rook compared to your position, like how can you deal with the files? If I can control the files, maybe I can control something in the game. The problem is the files are pretty closed, so since there's a pawn on c2, you want to move rook lift and use the rook on the third rank. Now, in this case, I don't know. I mean, I could play queen f5, I can look at moves like e4 in the future. Wait a second. He's actually played c4. c4 has been played. That's a pawn sacrifice. Queen. The pawn has gone to c4, cementing the pawn on d5, shutting the bishop on b7 out of the game, at least for the moment that bishop could reroute itself with the move c4 now, saying to Gary, you're never going to attack along this diagonal. I, I don't want to know about the ghost of the attack along that diagonal. But the question still bears consideration. Queen to f5, what does he have up his sleeve against this particular move? Yeah, just really quickly, I don't think that Kasparov can actually take on c4. Uh... It looks suicidal to begin with. Well, bringing the rook, the rook into the C1 game which just seems unnecessary. Completely if difficult. not lost, but at least unnecessary. Yeah, it just looks very bad. So I don't think this is going to happen. But queen f5, you're asking, looks pretty logical to me. You still have ideas of knight f3, bishop c8 in the future. But okay, at least you've been able to reinforce that pawn on d5. And that gives you a little leeway for sure. There was another line, if we could go back really quickly before he moves, there was another line that's completely ridiculous. Bishop takes on e5. Is that, no, it didn't, is that just... No, it, it didn't quite work. The problem was that after pawn takes and e, d6... No, I was going to just play rook takes. I was going to wait because the d6 threat was coming with threat of d7 as well. I just don't think that you can do this because I play king f8. And and I know this is pretty crazy, but I thought that you were losing after d6, bishop g2. I thought that I'd just allow you to take and I go king g7. And, and now the queen, something appears on h3. Mm -hmm. Even a knight, even if I under-promote, no, that's not going to do it. And queening and there's mating ideas. Yeah, that's a bit too much. All right, worth, yep. definitely worth looking at, but a too sharp an idea. So let's get back to the game. The move, the position on the board with the knight on g5, and now short has played c4, which looks like it has nothing to do with the king side, but he's decided he could shore up that king side with his own pieces, maybe a rook on a3 at some point. And the clock times, both players playing pretty quickly, at least staying even on the clock. Yeah, they're staying even position. in a very sharp position. There was a lot to calculate. There were a lot of resources to take into consideration. And even now, piece placement is not so obvious. Even the last move, C4, you know, we didn't even consider. We were looking at so many other variations that can still be played. And it's easy for us to just make moves on the board and see, say, well, this, this, and that. But wow, calculating it over the board with clock the ticking clock down? ticking. Come on. It's, Come, Come on, we know about that. 
everybody on the side with their engines, they know the truth, right? You get people saying, oh, how are they flying so badly? You try to do this. Exactly. <laughs> have That's the whole world looking at you, the clock ticking down, complex variations to analyze, and the human brain trying to work out the multiplicity of possibilities. That is not easy. And we see here these great champions trying to work it all out, the move C4 played by short. He's got to feel, be feeling a little bit better, though, I think. I think it looked happy. like he was gonna die. I, I mean, think, it, I think he's super happy. You got the feeling he was on a tightrope. Well, it, it's it's a good feeling from a lot of psychological points of view because, like yesterday's game, when Kasparov was having this wonderful attack in the first rapid, he had all this initiative and he felt it. He felt there was a win, and I have the feeling that Kasparov has this in the back of his mind at the moment that the sacrifice looked so strong. There had to be something. And it's something that is in the back of my mind. I'm not, I didn't even play the sacrifice. So I'm sure that he's looking at this position and saying, something went wrong. Yes. This is not exactly as clean as it should be. White has too many resources. Where's my attack? Yeah, you, you're looking at the position and realize you have to play chess. When a second ago, it thought, you thought you were just going to run a snowball down the hill and mm -hmm. hit the guy at the bottom. Right now, he just has to play chess. It just looks like an even game. There's possibilities for both sides. It, Plenty of ways for both sides to make mistakes. White's king still under a little bit of pressure. On the other hand, that structure on the queen side is kind of worrying me a little bit. Another point of c4 is simply to go queen b3 and then start taking everything on the on the queen side. Eventually, eventually. eventually. We gotta make sure nothing's happening. You're not getting blasted on the other side of the board. Uh, no knight h3 checks, funny business happening. But because that bishop on b7 is not in the game, because that bishop on e7 is not in the game, and you're only functioning with these three pieces, and white's bishop is on that side, the rook is helping as well, enough pawns, there are no easy breakthroughs, it means that white's okay. And that's, unless that bishop on b7 somehow reroutes itself and ends up on g4, then you start talking about maybe a little action. But that's going to take a few moves, and white, black's queen has to move, the bishop has to move. I don't think he has anything immediate. I think at the moment he has to do exactly what you're saying. Reroute his pieces, make them useful, make them threaten things. He doesn't have the firepower to just blast open that king on g1 right now. He has to be a little bit more patient. If he goes for a crazy style of attack, just throw pawns forward or not develop all of his pieces, then Short will be able to greedily take the entire queen side without really anything happening to him. Not to mention the fact that that bishop e5 idea might start working, creeping into some variations with the black king still on the center of the board. There's, it's not like white is just sitting here now waiting for slaughter. I mean, he's, he's got plenty of ideas to we play for. We have a close position right now, and in close positions, knights are pretty good, and usually bishops and rooks don't play so well. But the important thing is that close positions can always turn into open positions. All you need to do is sacrifice a piece, trade a couple of pawns, and suddenly this rook's ambitions become monstrous. The king on e8, for now, it looks safe, but it's not going to be safe in the long run. This bishop e5 idea is already up in the air. There's always ideas of f4, which we had already mentioned. So it's not like Kasparov is sitting pretty here and saying, oh, I'm just safe, I'm going to move my pieces around. No, Short has some really good, really good ideas as well. Kasparov spent a lot of time yes, here. Yes, psychological momentum has certainly shifted in White's favor. That sacrifice on c3, when we see them in the books, Classically, the sacrifice on c3 usually ends in disaster for the white pieces. Black just puts all his pieces on great squares and suddenly there's a mating attack or he's just gobbling on multiple pawns. That did not happen here and Kasparov feels that shift in the position. So does Short, no question about it. Both of them realizing that Black is not going to win anytime soon and in the meantime Kasparov is struggling you know how it is when you have a great position this, to shift back out of I had a great position, maybe close to winning position, and now it's suddenly evenish and the guy has play. What did I do? I'm still thinking about that a little bit in the back of my mind. What do I do now? I need to focus. And Short feels that pressure on Kasparov. And look at that. Kasparov is starting to shake his head as the variations are not forthcoming. How to exactly play concretely? And we remember yesterday in the interview. He mentioned the idea that when the position was concrete, when it was something he could calculate, it was over. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to hit you here, hit you here, hit you here. But that's not what this is right now. Now it's a question of having that, that chess sense in your fingertips, that positional flow that comes from having played a lot and not being rusty, just being able to just put the pieces on the right squares. You just pick them up and put them down on the square. Gary's not in that kind of form. And he's showing it right now, spending a lot of time right now in this position. It's a lot of time, and the more I see the position, the less I think it's even-ish, and the more I'm saying, 
wait, why can't I just do that? Why can't I do that? Why can't white simply play pretty good moves? Queen b3, bishop a3, bishop c1, e3, f4. And a5, a pawn on the periphery has been moved. That looked like it has absolutely nothing to do with the chess position. A5 looks like a, a waste move. I've got to move because I've only got five minutes and change on the clock. I know the bishop is trying to get to that a6 square, so it's ostensibly a good idea. But I feel like if I were Nigel, I'd be thinking blast, uh, I'd be, blast away. I'd somewhere. be very happy with this move after a5. It just shows that you thought forever, you didn't come up with anything too aggressive, and he just plays quick chess. He, I like this by Nigel, even though maybe theoretically, and your engine says rook c1 is not the best move on the board. Who cares? You played it fast, it makes sense, you defend the pawn on c4, you bring a rook into the game, and you make Kasparov say, think, and prove why was a5 a decent idea. On top of which, like we said, we're trying to figure out how to maneuver the pieces to great squares. Bishop a6, you can have it. That's a square I want you to play. I'll make a waste move if you promise you're going to put your bishop on a6 because that's not going to hurt the king sitting on g1. The only way that could happen is if somehow the c-pawn were to disappear, but no way you're touching that c-pawn. No way. Not I mean, gonna the rook's going to be on c1. The only way you can actually take it is with the combined efforts of the bishop and the queen. But as soon as you take it with the bishop, there's going to be this problems down the c-file with the immediate pin. You would have to have some miraculous trick to get out of it. Well, maybe let's think about that for a second. The, there is a possibility that Kasparov is looking to put his knight on h3, and the only move is king f1, so the bishop would take on c4. Maybe that's the deeper idea. I can't imagine that idea works. It's, no, it works if I give you three free moves, but <laughs> exactly. I mean, I don't think that Nigel is going to allow that. No, of course, there are some ideas, and of course, there are some tactical resources, but at the moment, they're a little bit kind of helpmates. Yes. In the sense that, okay, white has to actually walk into it. Yeah, bishop a6, maybe I can technically take on c4 right now. But the problem is, like, most decent moves here by white just flat out prevent bishop takes c4. Right, queen b3 is queen possible b3, here, for example. Queen d3. Queen d3, another idea. So plenty of ways to stop this initiative, the attack. Not going Kasparov's way, but it seems he has played the move. Bishop to a6 is bishop on the board. Yeah. And this one tricky idea, putting the knight on h3, trying to challenge short now to deal with the possibility of the explosion on c4. So he found his only real idea in the position. It looks suspicious to us right now that it really works. It puts some pressure on c4 in the long run. It's an okay move. It's just that short doesn't feel the pressure at the moment. We were trying to kill white, but I guess Kasparov really figured out, hey, I can't do that. Let me just put my pieces on some decent squares at a list attacks that pawn on c4, which is difficult to defend in the long run, and maybe forces a piece to do so. That has to be his idea. He's not really trying to uh, gain that in initiative back, which maybe is a good idea. If you actually try for the initiative and the initiative only, you might have run out of pieces. There wasn't enough gunpowder in that barrel. Well, let's try queen b3 at the moment. It looks like a natural move. Why is this move refuted in some kind of way. It's not. I mean, it's just, it looks like the most obvious move to Let's me. Let's try queen g4 as a response, uh, just for black. Is this, is this something he has to worry about? The problem is that, well, you don't threaten knight f3, right? In most variations, you're just not threatening knight f3. So if I can move my rook, I guess I should be some sort of okay, like rook e3. Rook e3, but then maybe your rooks are connected badly, a knight to h3 check. And then bishop g5, I'm just looking ah, for some stringing tricks. for some tricks here. Anything? Right. I think you lose at some point here after I just go f4, but it might be a little more complicated than right. white wants it to be. And can you gain sack on f4, the knight maybe, and really get nuts? I, I can't imagine this working, but... Me neither, but it's probably as good as it gets for, for black coming from a practical point of view. And short having to look at those lines. That's the other thing, too. You have to look at complicated variations like this one because you don't want Gary to come up with some tactical trick that you fell asleep on and suddenly one of the greatest attacking players in history has got you on the, the business end of a wicked variation. So right. he has to be really careful. But the clock is ticking down only 4.51. I don't think these necessarily are the exact clock times. Maybe they match up with the clocks on the board. Let's see if we see the actual time. And there yeah, it is, actually, 451. It is matched up 718 for, for white and ticking down quickly. 
So we'll see. And uh, actually, it's not perfectly matched because he had only 7.18, right. but now with a 10 second and all that. So it's a little bit yeah, of a lag a there, so we'll pay attention to that. Lag. If we get to the time pressure, we're sure our able director will make sure that everything is perfect for us to take a look at and be, be timed out just right. We've been told that he's on break right now. <laughs> at any rate, let's see what happens next. Short taking a lot of time after this idea that we thought was fairly innocuous. He wants Bishop to make sure just a little nothing. ridiculous move, but it's, it's turning into a little bit more of an irritant than Short anticipated, or even that we anticipated, and Short sh shuffling in his chair there, not comfortable completely with what the next move should be. Right, he's not as comfortable as I expected him to be in this position. I'm trying to calculate some lines, and I'm even trying to just kill Black with some Bishop E5 sacrifices. I don't see them quite working at the moment. I'm trying to use the fact that your Bishop went to A6, so now I can play D6 lines, but the more I see it, the less I can make it quite work. There's always some details here and there that don't quite function. So maybe Short's also trying to make some of these sacrifices work. Well, let's take a look at that, I, that sacrifice, because I liked the sacrifice earlier, but I was able to refute it uh, with knight h3 if I tried right. to take on e5 right away. So See, I think I can take, and I just don't see enough threats. If, for example, d6, I can play bishop f6, and that holds the e5 square. Right. d7 doesn't seem like a threat. The critical line is rook takes on e5, e5, of course. Right, this is the critical line. Now, king f8, we should point out, king f8 is an idea, and d6 now is very different from before because of the d7 followed by a rook to e8 idea potentially coming up. But maybe even this is okay for black. Right, I don't see too much of a trouble right now. If I play bishop f6, d7, I move my queen to c7. I'm still holding the d8 square with my bishop. Exactly. And if you go check, I go king g7, and I still think I'm okay. Looks like that's all she wrote because d8 is Under covered control. so easily. 96 is coming on the next move. There's still some pressure, but I don't think it was quite worth sacrificing a bishop for this. Well, let me tell you, that idea by Kasparov, a5, bishop to a6, we thought queen b3 or maybe rook e3 or something quick would come. But Nigel has been thinking now for almost four, it looks like five minutes wow. on this move. So stroke of genius to Kasparov <laughs> because he has created just a little bit of niggling pressure to say, think about this. I am rerouting the bishop. We were trying to get the bishop all the way around to the g4 square. He has put it on the a6 square with little interesting tactics. And he is now ahead on the clock. Can you imagine this would have happened? Nigel, somebody wake this guy up because... He has been thinking for so long, a very impractical decision. We have now transformed from a rapid game to a blitz game. We are down to under five minutes, and Short finally has played queen b3. No way in the world, after all that thought, to play this move, unless there's a concrete refutation by Kasparov, and his queen has jumped to the g4 square, and rook from c to c2. Right, just defending the rook. Uh, it looks pretty solid. The queen on b3 still keeps the pressure on this pawn on b6. It also defends this uh, position on f3 immediately, so there are no knight f3 ideas right now. It challenges black to keep finding moves. Because my rooks are not on the awkward square that they were in the line that I gave in e3 and c3, there's no knight h3 checking f1 bishop g5. The bishop would just be hitting air. The knight on h3 here looks a little awkward to me. Incredible harmony now with the rooks, all of white's pieces connected. If black does not find a breakthrough, he could be facing potential sacrifices on e5. His b6 pawn at the moment is hanging, but is this a bad position for black? I mean, black clearly does not have the attack he had before, so maybe he just has to hunker down and play bishop d8 and, and let come what may. I don't know what the right move is here, but Kasparov is going to have to make a move soon because he is now under four minutes on the clock. Nigel with four minutes and 15 seconds. We're going to see blitz mode and very uncomfortable right now is Kasparov. His body language is telling everything. He has to reset his mindset to playing a blitz game because he was only 344. And Nigel there just taking a sip before the Boy, madness that starts. That Kasparov hovering over the board looking for some kind of continuation. I would almost guarantee once he plays a move, it's going to be blitz. It's they're, going to be blitz. They're both just going to go crazy. So. Well, we're going to see how well they adapt into time pressure. And we have to remember, blitz is a totally different game than time pressure. Yes, it's the same amount of time, but the way you've been thinking about the position for the last 
what, 40, 50 minutes, it's completely, completely different. Then you have to suddenly play blitz? No, it's not the same. And we see a lot of players fail in time pressure, even though they're good blitz players, because it's a different ball game. Kasparov now under three minutes. It's 2.54. We needs saw to him play. He needs oblivious to, play. to the clock yesterday, looking at the clock, and finally he brought his bishop back. He brought his bishop back, realizing he needed to make a move. This seems to potentially hang the b6 pawn, but that's a dangerous pawn to take at the moment at least because knight f3 check might be playable. You need nurse of steel to play something like queen takes b6, but <laughs> th then again, to beat Kasparov, well, you need them. Uh, you could take on b6. I don't see any immediate refutation after knight of three check. I have to play king f1. Well, let's take a look at this analysis because this crazy knight, if this doesn't work, then Kasparov's just in trouble. Queen takes on b6, knight queen of, takes b6, knight of three check, check king, king f1. one Now, you could keep checking me, but I don't really think that you're going to make too much progress after knight of three check again. Even here, I can go king d1. And it and just what about, seems like... Is bishop f5 ever going to be in the mix? He yet? has to play bishop f5 at some point. He might as well do it from the beginning. Uh, with the idea of maybe bishop e4 also to trade off that bishop. Uh, this bishop on g2 is holding the position together. That bishop disappears and white position collapses. Also bishop d3 could come in the mix at some point at some as well. Point. I'm also attacking that rook on c2. So it's definitely still very, very dangerous here. A critical decision for short what to do, and he's played f4. f4. Finally, this aggressive move. Fire f4 with fire. On the board, Amazing. f4. And Kasparov really has no time to think about it. This is not something you can calculate. You've got to make a move. f4. The, we do have a 10 second delay in this game, so if you don't see the time start immediately, it's because of that 10 second delay. But f4, attacking the knight, is on the board. Knight f3 is not in play right now. Short being very aggressive, 231. Left for Kasparov and ticking down very quickly. He, he needs to make a decision, but White's pieces look completely harmonized. I mean, I, it doesn't look like Black could possibly have anything here. But I'm a little confused, because do you have any other move than knight h3? And he's played he knight needed, h3 He needed check. to play that immediately. Because it was his only move. That's incredible. Well, he may could play knight h7, which no, looks but that's disgusting. Disgusting. You but, don't play that. <laughs> but now, what does he do? He can't take an f4 because the rook on h8 is hanging. That bishop on the b2 square is hitting the rook. So he can't do that. So what can he do here as black? I mean, well, he could try bishop f5, maybe bringing the bishop into the game. He can think about sacrifices on f4, but I don't see them working at the moment. Let's take a look at this. Uh, Bishop f5 looks to me like this. And he's played solidly. He's plays f6. Oh, interesting. f6, keeping lines closed, keeping lines closed the for pawn. the moment. It's not so good for a white to go like this, as rook would eventually come to f8, say thank you for the free open file. And yeah, this looks very, very dangerous. I don't think we're going to see an f takes e5 unless it really wins something for white. On the other hand, Maybe I can play a little bit slower, play something like queen f3. Queen f3 looks very attractive right now. Just right. Defending just, everything. You want to trade off those pieces. This looks like a great move for white, but he has not played it as yet. His time is ticking again. He's calculating, worried maybe about some line, but it just looks like queen f3 is a very natural response it's here. It's natural, and on the other hand, I mean, can he take on b6 and say... Well, so if he takes on b6, he has to deal also with queen takes on g3. And what happens there? I mean, unless he has something concrete, he does look like he may be able to play queen c6 check. Let's try that line. Queen c6, well, is there any mate I have to worry about on this side? I don't quite see any immediate threats. I was trying to... And he has played queen f3. He said, no, yeah, forget queen it. Queen f3 makes forget a lot it. more sense. Slow right. it down. Queen f3. And queen f3, but not with much of an advantage on the clock. Now looking for an ending that potentially could be advantageous, but at the same time, this doesn't look terrible for black. The, the bottom line, though, is that they're going to be blitzing, and they're going to have to play very quickly. Well, the end games do seem pretty bad. It's not so much that you're down the exchange. I'm a little worried about the knight on h3. I don't see how you can get it back into the game. If Kasparov finds a good way to do so, he might go for the end game. But if he doesn't, the knight on h3 might just be stuck for the rest of the game, and then, OK, you cannot really play like this. So he has avoided it with the move queen to f5. Queen to f5 on the board, and now Potentially taking on f4 with a pawn has become a threat in the position. Uh, it's hard to believe he could just open the file that way, but it does seem as though it is possible 
to now, take on f4 with a pawn. Right, and it is very important that after pawn takes e5, pawn takes e5, this is a completely different endgame because the knight can now go back to g5, rejoin the rest of the pieces, and therefore here black's not doing so badly. Complex play by both these players. They only have a minute and 40 seconds to go on the clock. This could still, if you just add another 30 minutes, they could still be playing, but they do not have the luxury of the time on their side, and somehow Short is going to have to make a move. He is down to 122 and counting on the clock, and he has played the move Rook to e4, Rook to e4. He defends that pawn on f4. You were just mentioning how that might be a possibility. It prevents it in two ways. First, because the pawn is actually defended, but also, apparently more importantly, it allows him to double up on the e-file in certain variations where this opens up. So Rook e4, a little, relatively multi-purpose move. Indeed, and also getting the rook away from any bishop that might land on g4 in the future. Right. So I am worried a little bit about some bishop's skewers on the f5 position, but at the moment, okay, there's a queen there. I can't quite do it. Well, king f7 has been played. King f7, just safeguarding his king, making a move, passing, saying, okay, you played rook e4, you solidified your position, but I can do the same. Show me the money right now, and down to 126. These guys haven't really caught the memo yet. Listen to this, man. Look at this. 120 need, need and counting. the move bishop c1. The thing is, it's not just needing to play. It's needing to get into blitz mode. And now he's right. under a minute. Exactly. 57 seconds. This is outrageous. And he's just looked at the clock and realized his situation is perilous. He needs to make a move. 49 seconds left and counting. And he's still calculating variations. Not sure what to do. Okay, play. Come on. <laughs> Make a move. He's looked at the clock yet again, and his hand on the chin is not the pose you want right now. And he's played the other rook over to e2, and Kasparov knows he has a significant edge on the clock. Queen That's to what you G4. need to be doing. You need to play quickly. Absolutely. Queen to g4 has been played. That does allow the end game after takes. The on difference is e5. that here the e2 rook would be hanging at some point. Well, not if he takes, if he takes, he attacks the queen. Takes on e5, rook is attacking queen. That forces a trade, right? Although the knight g4, g5 right, might happen. This is the end game that I and wanted. Here's, and here it is. This has happened. Takes, right. takes, and this idea of knight, no, he's not going to let. I don't think you can allow e6 check. That e6 would just check be would terrible. be very strong. So indeed. you need to take first. I think he's thinking about which one, because taking with the other pawn is actually not such a bad idea, giving some Breathing room to and the bishop. he has given white a pass pawn, but his bishop is in the game. And now rook okay, to h4, h4, looking to trade off rooks. Yeah. A big moment, but that has allowed a knight to ensconce itself on f4. f4. The knight coming back in this position looks crazy. It's looks still very nuts. hard to evaluate. It's cr this is a crazy position, and Nigel with only 27 seconds and counting down. He's not going to get any increment here. No added time, just a delay. But from a practical point of view, this is so much easier to play for black. So much easier. You have this pass pawns in the center, you have some weaknesses to attack, you have a4's weak, c4's weak, and the powerful knight on f4. The knight is always in such a nice asset in, in blitz. Yeah, and now look at this. Bishop to c5, and Kasparov knows he has a super solid position. The d-pawn is not going anywhere anytime soon. And most importantly, that bishop on b2 has no potential. I mean, just none. Best they can do, it looks like it's trade itself off with the knight on f4. And that's irrelevant right now, because he's got 11 seconds left. He's Ten. just got to make a move. And he's played d6. d6. Basically sacrificing anyway, this pawn. Look at how Kasparov just kind of adjusted the pawn on d6 like he's had the time to do that on his own time as a matter of fact and now Amazing. bishop h3 check the king has to move the king has to go to a1 and now bishop to b4 winning back the exchange that's not good news for white absolutely not moving his king and kasparov even hesitating to take this rook but why not? D2. Why not take it? He's going to do it. I don't see why not. It's the exchange being recovered. The pawn on d6 still weak. Not a walk in the park to win yet. And he has ignored the taking wow. and played bishop back to d7, ripping off that pawn on a4. Now he's got a pass pawn on the a file. That was a very surprising decision. But he feels like, oh, and he's taking a pawn on d6 as well. Now he's up material. Now he's just up. Now he's, he's winning he's on winning. the board, he's winning, winning on the clock. He's a minute advantage almost on the clock. And now he can stop and play f5, coming on strong. And now the move e4 attacking is Gary Kasparov in his element. No, there's just too much play here. The material is not enough for short. Pawns are coming. This is really easy. For and now that. a knight on d3, just but posting on deep H2 in the under position. Attack. Look at that bishop on h1. That's, Ridiculous piece. That's not the bishop you want. This is this is all Gary. This looked like the exchange sack, which you should have gotten out of the exchange right. sack. Mm -hmm. And now bishop on d1 coming in on the other side, and now. 
Pretty nice limited. little Back maneuver. The pawn is C4 hanging. Now, There's knight C1 as a threat. And an exchange sacrifice in order to mess up the game just a little bit, but he's this down like a desperado. three pawns. Just a desperado. Count them. Three pawns with only 18 seconds on his clock. This is just technique now. And Nigel just moving quickly. King to B2 and now A4 Before and now the resigns. other pawn. This, this is, is definitely resigns. a resignable position. But he's going to play. He's going to let Kasparov show that he, he can just win this game. The pawn on D3 is hanging. So B5, B5. What, what, what pawn on D3 he's saying? What? Any simplification here would be an easy win. If, for example, king takes D3, bishop takes C4 check. Very obvious win here with the two extra pawns. Absolutely. It's still making moves is short. He, he has been stuck on 18 F4. seconds for quite some time. But now F4. Follow up with king F5, king G4. I don't even think you need the pawn on A4 to win. Agreed. This is overwhelming. And Gary Kasparov has won a thrilling battle. What a fight. We thought that... He was going to win easily, but it took him all the way down to the last 30 seconds on the clock to win the game. An absolutely thrilling game. Fantastic. Wow. What wow. a fight. This is what we, we paid to see. And we didn't have to pay to see it. So this is incredible. Kasparov looking very happy, uh, content, having won the game. But this is a serious situation for Nigel to score now. Wow, so it's difficult. It was such a messy game. This is the kind of game that Nigel had he won, had he proven himself, he would have been like, okay, maybe my opening was not so great, but we got into complications, you didn't finish me off, I fought back and I won. But the contrary, he even let him back in the game and he won anyway. That was incredible. What a display of fighting chess by Kasparov. When you saw his time tick down to four minutes and Short had about nine minutes on the clock, a decent position, everything seemed okay. I mean, right there you see a jovial Kasparov, uh, certainly you see the light in his eyes and his cheeks. This, this has got to be a go to win. You win with black.